Explanation of Immigrants here on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's 10 o'clock block on a given Monday. And uh, we're talking about David Maeda, who is running for director of elections in the state of Minnesota. And he, he he's here joining us. We're going to talk to him. Um, but Chang, uh, you're my uh, co-conspirator on this. I wonder if you could really give a proper introduction to David. I will try. Good morning, Jay. Good morning, David. It's a privilege to uh, be with uh, Jay and uh, uh, hosting David Maida. David Maida is a director of elections in the state of Minnesota and a former chair of Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. Mr. Maida is a second generation Japanese American. David Maida graduated from McCluster College in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1987. In addition to serving as Minnesota city clerk, Mr. Maida serve, served as the chair of Minnesota Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans, a charter commissioner of the city of St. Paul, and a former chair of League of Minnesota City's Election Task Force. Mr. Maida previously also worked as a Hennepin County election supervisor. I worked with David for the past two years on the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans, and under his leadership, and the council took a lot of initiative. I'm really grateful for his leadership and guidance. It's our great honor and privilege to have you here, David. Thank you. Welcome to the show, David Maeda. It's, it's, it's great to have you here. Did I misstate that? Um, you are already the director of elections in the state of Minnesota. Is there an election coming up by which you would be, you know, continued in that spot? Hi, Jay. Thanks for the uh, invite to this. I'm honored to be a guest on the show. But to answer your question, it's an appointed position. I report to the Secretary of State, who is Steve Simon in Minnesota, and he's actually on the ballot in November. Ah, got it. And so um, I have a recollection that uh, Minnesota is one of those states uh, where you have um, a Republican legislature that does uh, the kinds of things that the GOP does in various states, um, which is um, not necessarily constructive. Um, and that makes the Secretary of State at risk, doesn't it? Well, we actually have a very, I think we are the only state in the country that has a split legislature. So the Republicans control the Senate and then the um, Democrats control the House and that we have a, uh, a Democrat governor. And it makes, it's particularly for elections law, law changes, it makes it very hard to get anything through because because of that divide, we have to have, we have an unwritten rule in our state that there has to be bipartisan support for any election related changes and reaching that has, has been a challenge to name it. If the Secretary of State doesn't win in this uh, upcoming election, th th then you lose your job? Um, not necessarily, no. I could be continue under the new secretary, but Hopefully we won't get to that point. <laughs> we'll oh, no, we won't. We won't. <laughs> Hopefully we won't. Yeah. So um, yeah. So why why do you do this, David? I mean, this is um, you know it's a, it's a, it's an interesting position to occupy in these times. Well, it, it's something I actually kind of accidentally fell into when I graduated from college. I got a job with the state of Minnesota, and I happened to get a job in the Secretary of State's office in the Corporations Division. I immediately gravitated towards elections because it seemed like the most interesting part of the office. And then I started a career, and I've, as Chang mentioned in my introduction, I was a Hennepin County election supervisor. Um, my last job was with the city of Minnetonka, which is a suburb of Minneapolis, and I was a city clerk, and I ran elections for the city. So elections, is I strangely stumbled upon into it, but it's been my entire career. And I think, to, to your question, the, the past couple of years have been extremely difficult to be an election administrator, just because of all the misinformation and disinformation that are causing people to really question the integrity of our system. And that's really my focus this year, is to make sure we get good, transparent information out about voting in Minnesota. You know, there's been news reports in various states around the country of um, threats uh, made to election officials. Have you received any? I personally have not. We are tracking that in the state. There have been some of our county election officials that where somebody I think has crossed the line. It's, we are in touch with both the D D Department of Justice and FBI on this issue. They actually stood up a task force where we can report any threats that are made against us. 
Um, recently, a county official did report something that I thought crossed the line in Minnesota, but yes, it, it, it makes it very difficult to try to operate in this environment. The possibility, does it in any way um, limit your passion for the subject? It's a very good question. I don't think it necessarily limits my passion for the subject, but I will name that I never saw this coming. I, I always thought people would trust us as, as election officials that we knew what we were doing and doing our job correctly. So it doesn't necessarily um, decrease my passion for the, the this career I've led, but it does really, um, I guess, depress me that we are in the state we are in. I understand. Well, may, may I just jump in? I, I, uh, I just want to jump in and thank uh, David personally and thank all the Secretary of State. Uh, uh, in the United States, you know, uh, I was teaching a constitutional courses uh, last semester, and when I we analyzed the state of the union, uh, and together with the students, and we we finally reached the conclusion that the United States, the democracy, was not saved by the check and balances, was not saved by se separation of powers, was not saved by all the mechanism of founding father put in place to protect the republic. Instead, the democracy was indeed saved by civil servants like David, saved by the uh, uh, secretary of state, says, uh, saved by the professionals who diligently counted and accurately counted the votes and reported the votes and was not uh, pressured by any undue influence. So I have this uh, utmost respect to our civil servants and in particular Secretary of State and election officials. So here I just want to shout out to David and his office, Secretary uh, Steve Simon and all the Secretary of State in, in the United States. I wanna to add to that if, I, if you don't mind. <clears throat> you know, I think the distinguishing point about democracy is the peaceful transition of power from one administration to the next. And the next, of course, is determined by voting. Um, if you don't have voting, you don't have a democracy. If you don't have representative government, you don't have a democracy. And if, if you don't have a peaceful transition of power, you don't have a democracy. Uh, as a matter of fact, Think Tech is doing what we call a super show on April 1st. Mm -hmm. And we're examining how this works in seven continents around the, around the globe. We'll talk to people in many, many places and ask them about their brand of democracy or their mm, other brand which is not democracy. But that seems to be a fundamental point. <clears throat> so uh, I, I, I would like to ask you about your interest in voting and what, it, what you think it means to the country, to the democracy as, as we used to understand it. That's a very good question. I think, I mean, I often hear when, when helping a voter, a voter will say to me, well, I've done my part. Which is true. I think voting is a crucial part of democracy, as both you and Jane just said. But, but to me, it doesn't stop with voting. It's it's to continue to um, hold your elected officials accountable, make sure that they're doing what they said they would do to get you to vote for them. And so I think it's the, the beginning of the process, but it's not, it's not the end of the process. I think we all need to stay involved with, to hold our government accountable. Yes, Absolutely. I certainly agree. So, you know, there, there, there have been uh, these um, <clears throat> baseless claims of voter fraud around the country. And as the director of elections, you would know about voter fraud in the state of Minnesota. And I wonder if you could comment on whether there has been any significant voter fraud or irregularities in voting in your, during your tenure in the state of Minnesota. Well, that's a very easy question to answer. The answer is no. I mean, in every election, an ineligible voter, one or two might vote. I mean, whether they're a felon that shouldn't vote in our state, if you're under a felony sentence and not off paper, you're not supposed to vote. Whether it be someone that's not 18. I mean, occasionally somebody can vote that is ineligible, but that all gets turned over to our law enforcement and those um, people are, are um, investigated and, and often charged for doing that. But as far as widespread fraud, no. I've seen no evidence of that during my 25 plus years in elections in Minnesota. 
Let's talk more about Minnesota. Minnesota, um, you know, to me, I'm, I'm I'm from New York and Hawaii. That's that's my background. <laughs> and I never thought much of Minnesota. It was somewhere near the Canadian border, as I recall. I hope that's right. <laughs> and um, you know, I didn't think of it in terms of diversity, uh, but it would seem to me uh, what I've learned in recent years is there's plenty of diversity in Minnesota. Um, how is diversity doing in Minnesota? Well, well, same same question, same question, Lai, or may I just add that uh, you know, whenever I see David, I, I feel proud of to be uh, a Chinese Minnesotan, and we have a Japanese American to be uh, our election official, and so it, it, we we have we have this council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans, and uh, about uh, no no more than a, uh, a dozen ethnic minority group uh, represented. On the council, David obviously Japanese American representing Japanese American, myself representing Chinese American, and I, I always curious. I never really ask David about this question. How how you guys settled in Minnesota? You know, J Japan is cold, but not this cold. And how you why your parents decided to 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 settle in Minnesota? I know you were born in Minneapolis. You you are local, but how come your parents? decided to, to, to settle in Minnesota. To tell us about your story and also the Jay's question about the diversity in the state of Minnesota, please. Yes, sure. please, David. So all four of my grandparents were the ones that immigrated to the United States. So my dad was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. And my mom was born and raised in Lingle, Wyoming, which is a very tiny town in Wyoming, not a farm. Um, my dad's family actually was incarcerated during World War II and, and was sent to a camp in Minidoka, Idaho. And so my dad experienced firsthand the, the incarceration that occurred to Japanese Americans during World War II. My mom's family was not. They, they were allowed to continue to live on their farm in Wyoming. Um, my dad ended up here because my aunt, his sister, uh, got a scholarship offered from both McAllister, which is my well, I'm, I'm an alum of McAllister and Hamlin, which is another university here in Minnesota. So she ended up going to Hamlin and that's why she, we, my dad ended up in Minnesota. I'm thankful for that because the other place she was looking at was Atlanta, Georgia. And I don't think I would have done as well. And I'm a Minnesota Twins fan. I couldn't be an Atlanta Brave fan to tell you the truth. Uh, there it is, right there, there it is. There it is. But my mom, my mom was uh, got her nursing degree and she got her first job in. She didn't want to be, be a farmer's wife. So she went to the University of Wyoming and got a nursing degree. And she ended up um, working in a hospital in Minneapolis. Yeah, and, it's a well, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, mean, I was mistaken. I thought you were second generation, obviously, you're third generation. And have you been to Japan yourself? Yeah, so one of my first jobs out of college was working for a record store here in the Twin Cities. And the owner happened to be somebody whose dad was in the army in Japan during World War II. So he, the owner of the store actually spoke more Japanese than I do. And he looked at, it in the late 1990s, he looked at opening a store in Tokyo. And so he asked me if I'd like to come along and I did. And it was an interesting experience because he being a white person, Everybody, all the Japanese assumed I was his interpreter. And like I said, he spoke much more Japanese than me. So they would come up to me and start speaking in Japanese. And I, <laughs> I couldn't answer that. And so that was my one time in visiting Japan. We also went to Osaka. I was just really happy with that visit. I want to go back so badly. Yeah, I went to Nagoya and Kyoto. I was so you know, impressed. But same time, when walking in the temples of Japanese temples, uh, most of them are not Buddhist temples, obviously, and uh, I feel a little bit, you know, sad. You know, it's a few. I, I can feel the uh, I emphasize with Japanese people when they uh, have this heavy history uh, on their back. But uh, you do. I'm sorry to hear your grandparents were incarcerated you know, during World War II, and we all familiar with FDR's executive order in 1966, the Japanese internment and uh, Kromasu versus the United States. And in recent years, some Chinese American began to fear similar treatment from the US government should US-China tension escalate. So what's your comments or what's your advice to, to us? Well, I will name that the Japanese American Citizens League, which is the largest Japanese or Japanese American organization representing Japanese Americans, 
the focus of that organization since 2001 has really been making sure people are aware of the parallels between what happened to the Japanese Americans in World War II and Islamophobia. I mean, mm -hmm. they've done a lot of great programming around tying what happened to Japanese Americans to what occurred in the early 2000s and continues to occur with people of Is Islamic faith. Um, but to your point, I think we saw some of that, Chang, in 2020 with the pandemic, where unfortunately we had people calling the COVID the China flu. And I think that really put a target not only on Chinese Americans, but on all Asian Americans. And I, I would agree with your, the premise of your questions. If things continue to deteriorate between our country and the Chinese government, then it is going to make things I, I think it's easy for people to find targets to blame things on, and I think it will put, put a target on the Chinese American community if that continues along the lines we're on. Well, good to know. Well, going, going to the question of diversity, you know, um, how has many Minnesota done on diversity? Well, if I walk down the street, am I going to see a rainbow of people? And are those people all going to be able to get, um, you know, jobs? Is there social justice among the various, you know, elements of the diversity? Uh, is the diversity increasing, decreasing, staying the same? Um, is there bigotry? Is there bigotry against uh, one group or the other or all, all minority groups? How, how is Minnesota? Well, Jay, that to answer that question, I I think it would take me about five hours to unpack everything you just asked. I will I'll say a couple things, um, and tying it back to my career in elections, we have a very large Hmong American community here in St. Paul and Minneapolis primarily, but in other parts of the state as well. It's so large in Ramsey County that for the first time ever in our state, we fall under what's called Chapter 203 of the Voting Rights Act, where the Hmong population has enough in Ramsey County that Ramsey County and our office are required to translate things into the, the language for them. And that's the first, so the Hmong community, I think, is growing and thriving, particularly in Minnesota. But I think in other areas, particularly our um, newer, refugee, newer ref, ref, refugee groups, I think they're struggling. Um, with things like housing and employment. And then, of course, Minneapolis is where George Floyd was killed. And so I think I, I think we're at various stages on the continuum, but um, I will name, I grew up in a suburb of St. Paul, and I was one of two Asian Americans in my class. That happened to be Japanese American, too. And to see the community that I grew up with have substantially more Asian Americans has been really thrilling to me. So I think there are certain pockets in our state that are thriving as far as getting more diverse, but there are others that are not. I mean, we're, it's it's a very complex question you just asked. Well, you know, there's, a, you know, there's always a distinction between uh, um, Ichi, Ichi, let's see, and Nisei, Sansei, and, you know, third generation is pretty much assimilated, but not not always necessarily to the full extent, especially if you look different. Um, you know, um, my, my family of Jewish came from, are you ready? Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, settled in New York. But what I, what I found very interesting, and I'd like to ask you about this, is there are pockets and communities uh, of re religious Jews all over the country in small towns, <clears throat> and they do well. They, they they become public officials like you. They become judges. They you know run for office, what have you. They um, and there doesn't seem to be a big distinction. I mean, I'm sure some people are going to be bigoted. That's the way it is in these United States. But in terms of uh, opportunities, in terms of being able to assimilate relatively comfortably, make a living, be middle class or better, they have been able to do that <clears throat> even in tight little relatively orthodox communities. So how does that play out in Minnesota? How does it play out, for example, I, mean, I know I'm asking you a, a compound question, and, and if we were in court now, a Chang would object. He would say, that's a compound question, Jay. That's what he would say. Uh, how does that play out in terms of districts, neighborhoods, redistricting? So again, in Minnesota, we have a 
a more diverse community in the seven, we call it the seven county metro area, which encompasses both Minneapolis and St. Paul and most of our larger suburbs. Um, so those are the areas we see the most diverse, ra racial diversity in the state. But again, there are pockets in other parts of the state like Rochester has a fairly large Indian American community, um, Asian Indian American community. Uh, Southwest Minnesota has, has, a, has a fairly large Hmong population. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question. To, to, yeah, I think, uh, uh, let, let, let me jump in here. So, uh, you know, David is a government official and uh, have to be professional and neutral. I, I, have, I, I call your attention to the very famous, you know, saying the Minnesota nice is passive aggressive. And it's, it, we, we Minnesotans hate that word. We don't like to be called Minnesota nice because actually there are some, you know, a negative connotation to that. But uh, uh, it's also, I, I think that it is, I believe the word is neutral. So Minnesota nice means the, the, the state is very tolerant. It's have a lot of empathy and uh, we have many different mi minority groups. And it's a very, Minnesota very famous for hosting refugees from, from various parts of the world, among uh, Americans and uh, Somalians. And now you walk into any major bank, you can see a Somalian clerk and uh, you'll be, don't be surprised. You, 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 you walk into the legislature, you'll, you'll see there's a among American caucus, you know, several legislatures are among Americans. But at the same time, yes, the ethnic minority groups, even African-American groups, they do, they, they do not have all the privileges, privileges and immunities other, uh, you know, the majority groups enjoy. That is a simple a fact. But the, the, kind, the state overall is very positive and uh, also have a very strong value system. So when the George Floyd tragedy happened, and it, uh, overnight you see thousands and thousands of people on the street, and you see the public statement from the, all the government, all, all level of government officials, from the gov governor to the attorney general, to the mayor, and to the county commissioners. So it is uh, overall, I would say that, uh, I, I'm not sure David would publicly say that, but I think overall Minnesota is a very, very good state for diversity, at least we have this uh, very good value system and 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 a potential. And I I sorry to to uh, speak too long, but I know David have some very good photos want to show us about his his family and the career. Please show us and tell us about the story behind these photos. You've seen some of them. <clears throat> Our engineer has been playing them. There's there's one. That's you as a kid, David. Yeah. This is actually my father and my aunt, who I mentioned oh. before. That's them, I'm assuming, in Seattle. That, that would be probably 40s, 50s? Oh, no, that would be early uh, that. 30s. Oh, 30s. Oh. How about next one? Again, my dad and my aunt. James. Oh, that's your dad and your aunt. Yep. <laughs> He's a very cute kid, as you can see. Oh, yeah. I, I thought it was you. <laughs> Your daddy is cuter than you, David. <laughs> this, this is actually me, and this is That's me. You. With a, I have, I'm a big music lover, and this photo actually shows my favorite thing as a kid, listening to records. You, you, and, who you listen to? Presley? Um, Beatles? A lot of Burl Lives. I don't know if you know Burl Lives. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. And that's me as a kid as well. The thing that to note with this picture is I'm sitting on a clown. I still have that in my house. Oh, really? <laughs> so I took it with me my entire life. Okay. From... <laughs> cool. Yeah, I had a sim hat when I was a kid. That's this you gave me lecture. one of my favorite pictures of me because it shows my better side. But this is me in my role as a chair of the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans. We used to have a day at the Capitol, hopefully we can do it again soon, but this is me mm -hmm. speaking to a group of um, constituents of the council. That's pretty cool. This is a this is a picture of Secretary Simon, our former press secretary in the office and myself. This was right after we finished the electoral college count in 2021, or 2020, I'm sorry. Wow, congratulations. 
This is me and my dad. This is one of the last photos I have with my dad. Mm. This is at, actually at one, one of my nephew's weddings. Does he mean Yes, yeah, it was. Mm. <clears throat> You have a well, big sir. family in uh, in Minnesota. I have uh, three sisters. Two of them are in Minnesota. One's in Los Angeles, and then I have a brother who's in Minnesota. Good for you. Yeah. So if I'm um, if I'm a young immigrant, say an Asian immigrant, and I call you up, David, and I say, "Look, um, I'm thinking about moving to Minnesota to Minneapolis. Um, what's your advice to me? Is it is it among the you know the the top places for me to go?" So the first thing I would say to you is, do you know what the weather is like in Minnesota? <laughs> first clarify that. But yeah, I mean, to me, it's been a wonderful place to grow up. I mean, I, I would not, I would not trade my life as far as where I've lived with anywhere else. It, it does, to, I mean, we do have a diverse community here in the Twin Cities. Um, I've been afforded wonderful opportunities in my career, obviously, and I feel very fortunate for the life I've lived. So yes, I would welcome any young Asian American into our state. You know, one thing has been clear to me over the past couple of years, well, over the Trump years, actually, which I was not aware of, is that we, we do have a growing diversity in many states, even in the South, you know, where white supremacy reigns supreme. Um, but the, the country is changing. And, it, and many, many people see it as a struggle. Uh, as a kind of extended civil war, uh, as, as, a, as a place where there are those who um, are qualified uh, to participate in the economy, the society, the democracy, and there are others who don't want them to participate in those things, who are concerned, who, who, who carry fear that those people, those diversity people will, re quote, replace them. We saw that in Charlottesville. We became aware of that, and we found it in other places. And I wonder how you feel about that. To the extent you can comment on it, I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Well, I think you, you, you hit upon, I think it really is about based on fear. I think once somebody gets to know another individual that looks different than them on an individual basis, some of that goes away, and hopefully all of it will go away in time. I think... I'll leave it at that. I mean, I think if we look at each other as human beings and not as different racially, I think that goes a long ways to understanding and moving the country forward in a positive way. Well, I mean, this, the name of this show, which uh, Chang, Chang selected, uh, is, is really appropriate. It's the Statue of Liberty. It's give me your tired, huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Um, and it's uh, the strength of the country is in that diversity and uh, we should nourish it, we should cherish it, we should encourage, incentivize it. So uh, Chang, we're almost out of time and I, and I know you, you would like to summarize and, and thank David for coming down and put, a, put this in perspective for us, okay? Thank you, Jay, and thank you, David, so much for coming to the show. Um, we are honored to hear your story and, uh, and thank you for sharing the family photos with, uh, 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 with us. A lot of fun to, to hear the story behind those photos. And I, I first I want to thank you as a professional, as a government official. And I always remember this uh, President Obama once said, there's no such thing as a vote that doesn't matter. And secondly, and uh, appreciate your interaction with Jay about the diversity and uh, 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 hear your story growing up in, in Minnesota. And as an immigrant, I couldn't be more proud to, to be a part of the Asian Pacific Minnesota community. And uh, just, just one thing I do want to emphasize that uh, we will not replace anybody. Instead, and as far as my 20 years in the United States, my ob own observation, I see immigrants are much more, uh, not more, as equally as patriotic as all the uh, naturally born Americans. And, but they are much more uh, uh, value the opportunity. They, they, they cherish the opportunity. They, greet, they are grateful of the opportunity to be here and to be part of the system. So I, I don't think they will uh, replace, we will replace anybody, nobody going to, and uh, they will replace anybody. Instead, they just want to be uh, 
be helpful and be useful and be uh, thankful to uh, be part of this uh, great system. You know, David, you get a chance to to follow that, okay? To comment on it, to rebut it, if you like. <laughs> No, well, I don't think I need to read better. I think I, I appreciate Chang your wisdom during the time I've got to know you. And I really think your point of view is well taken. I think that, that that's exactly right. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, Thank you, David. It's uh, nice to meet you and nice to hear, talk to you about your story and your thoughts. And um, may I say, as I said at the outset, um, um, it's fabulous that you're doing this work. You're doing it for all of us, not only in Minnesota, but everywhere. This is a, a critical element, may not be the only critical element, but it is a critical element in our democracy and therefore in our future. And you are at the center of it. And thank you from all of us for that. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, David Maeda. Appreciate your participation in think tech aloha